Hi, Vid. Hi, Hank. Hi, Sunny. I think uh, Bernard is in a car. <laughs> so we'll see how this goes. We have just. We don't have Pilar here today. Okay. Oh, no, we already made the transition. She was here and we did the handle. I, I, oh, she'll uh, probably she'll check in. I know, well, um, Declan was scheduled or is in the list of attendees in this session. So we'll see. Um, I think what uh, next year, there's the UN summit on the future, which I believe Declan will also be involved in organizing. And that's gonna be a bigger deal than this year. <laughs> so I think um, we could plan on something ab about that. Um, most definitely, and I, I think also there are some follow-up uh, actions um, and papers, follow-up. Follow yeah, up, now follow we, we'll have a report coming out. Um, I guess, well, we got one coming out uh, with Joe, and I think the same will need to be done well, with um, Bernard. Um, have a report that uh, basically we co-author as a group and um, and then we can build on that. Um, and then Pilar just advised um, that uh, the, the recording to the cloud that she asked me to make this morning and today and this afternoon um, that the recording to the cloud will be made available by them uh, next weekend after the okay. summit. Okay, okay. Well, I, I know um, in the African uh, situation, the uh, it was downloaded almost immediately. So um, I don't know. In this case, we're operating a little differently, perhaps, but we'll see. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I know you and I will keep our eyes open. Um, Adriano. Could we hear Adriano you? is here. <laughs> Hello. Could we see your video and do an audio check, please? I'm here. Hello. Excellent. Thank you. You're good to go. Um, Let me also Dr. put on my jacket. Hello, Hank. He is here. Hi. Here. Hi. How I'm, are you? I'm playing around with my backgrounds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the moon. I'm on the moon. I'm somewhere in space. <laughs> and this one, I'm on Earth wondering about where to go. OK. So. So uh, Adriano, it's so far it's Hank and Bid, um, Dr. Kumar and myself. And I, I will only turn my video on if they're to signal you that we have questions. So you don't have to monitor the chat. Is that all right with you? Yeah, sure. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi, Hank. <clears throat> Your audio video check is complete. You can relax and. Okay. My audio works, right?
let's see. Are you good to go, Vid? You can, um, everybody who's done an audio and video check who is speaking this afternoon, um, you, you can put yourselves on mute. Okay, Please. right. I can put myself on mute. Okay, our game plan is that each speaker will have about 10 minutes uh, to speak and then we move on. And uh, so far we have, uh, but we're missing a few folks. We're missing. We're yeah. missing one, two, three. X three. We're missing Bernard. <laughs> and Pascal and Kaisik uh, Lee. And Pascal, yeah, Pascal. And Manny Perez. Uh, Kim, your audio is very low. Oh, thank you. Hi, Serena. Hi, Kiran. Ciao. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Nice to Hello. meet you. Hello. Nice to meet you. Hello. Hello. You guys look smarter with glasses. <laughs> oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I tell these smart people with glasses are. <laughs> I just want to say that I lost my voice at a conference um, and uh, yeah, I, sometimes I have um, a problem to speak, <clears throat> but uh, actually in the previous session, there were three of them like me, so it seems to be difficult right now. Um, so um, if I sometimes go on mute, then it's because I'm, um, uh, you know, I have to cut for so I have no COVID. Yeah. Kim, uh, Kim, I, I, Kim, I make a test with my, my sharing my screen. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Great. You, okay. Who is actually starting the session? Uh, well, it was going to be Bernard, but um, I guess uh, I can uh, make a brief introduction here in the um, Space Agenda 2030. Basically, yeah. that outlines measures how using uh, space technology and the vision of going into space uh, to advance uh, the uh, sustainable development goals, as well as to uh, achieve the climate accord uh, goals as well. Um, what the space agenda, I guess I could show a very brief presentation about that. Let me go to the session. And uh, just a minute. Are we live already? Uh, we're, we're nine o'clock. I think we're live, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yes, so I, I thought so, we were so. gonna wait for Bernard. Can uh, you, you have uh, news? Okay, let's go for first with the news. I, I had understood we were gonna wait for uh, Dr. For Bernard. Bernard. Yeah, okay, let's do that. That's much better. A couple more seconds. Um, I think he's driving, you know, somewhere. He, he, he's driving, and uh, so he said he will. He wanted uh, basically me to start the session, and then we would um, we would uh, go for ten minutes with each speaker. And let me see what this does. I have a. Yes, we are live. We are live. Okay, very good. And let me see if I can find these files. They should be here. Uh, this is the wrong session. So I, uh, let me go to the file. Okay, this is the right session. And here I, we'll see what happens when I click on this file. Okay, can you see this or is this um, just on my screen? 
there's a presentation. Hello? No, yeah. yes. no we cannot see. We you cannot. cannot see it. Okay. Let me go to um, back to the uh, session here and then uh, do a share screen. You, you have full authorization for everything that you are. Okay. All right. You have it now. What um, in the um, last session that, or the previous to last, we dealt with energy situation in Africa. And uh, we, this is the Riga Photonic Center is partnered with the African um, network for uh, solar energy on Sol. And in that uh, organization, we're, we're trying to address the problem that there are 600 million people in Africa without access to electricity. And the forecasts by the International Energy Agency point to still 600 million people without access to electricity in 2030. And that's a very, very, very long stretch from achieving SDG 7, which says universal access to electricity or modern energy will be achieved by 2030. So what we did, let's see, okay, is to develop a, an agenda, an energy agenda with the UN that developed a plan for our organization, in that instance, ANSOL, is how, what we can do to achieve um, SDG 7. And uh, for Africa, our plan was to add capacity for research and development, uh, for education, training, and community mobilization, including through uh, church organizations. And uh, so this um, agenda was approved by the UN and that's what we're operating on in, for Africa. Looking through that and looking at Space Agenda 2030, um, the Space Agenda 2030 is the result of about three years of work by uh, Copius. And uh, they took the, uh, the instruments that were developed with uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals and basically adopted that how can space technology, space development um, help achieve those goals and achieve um, better outcomes from, for humankind? But there is no specific instrument and it seems we're facing possibly the same problem as occurred with energy, where when you look at kind of the usual way of doing business, uh, we would still be with 600 million people without access to electricity in Africa by 2030, unless something changed. Now, in the area of space, we do have these emerging power blocks, you know, with different agendas, different rules. And so my thought is this, what if we work with uh, UNOSA and develop uh, space, um, space compacts? So, uh, so an instrument that directly links organizations and what they do, including states, with actions to, ad to advance Space Agenda 2030. So he, here I run through the, what we did in Africa, uh, which culmination of several months of work, um, and we have an energy compact. So what if ACs or SRI or any other organization, maybe the International Space University, developed an energy or a space compact. Um, and here you can go into the details of what the compact program, ANSOL, what it does, and so forth and so on. So this is the idea that I'm tossing out at this time, to assure that Space Agenda 2030 goals can be met, UNOSA, manage a program of space compacts in critical areas where organizations, businesses, universities uh, make commitments to advance space agenda 2030 goals. 
So basically in the implementation, I'm suggesting this, that the pioneer organizations, where I say ACs and uh, SRI, or a country, possibly Austria, which uh, uh, seems to almost include Space Agenda 2030 role uh, uh, measures in its uh, national space strategy, could formulate a model for organizations to offer access, discussion at Copius, and then uh, we could possibly create a session at the next uh, UN Science Summit, which will be the UN Conference on the Future, September 2023, where we could look at efforts that we've made, you know, our different organizations, uh, different countries that would say, yes, we'd like to try that and offer some models for space compacts and then uh, see if uh, how UNOSA and uh, COPIAS could advance that to actually encourage uh, specific forms of cooperation in international space affairs. So basically that is my offering here and I'll, let's go on with the rest of the session. I've got to stop share here somewhere, stop share. So now my screen sharing is paused. We want to stop share. There we are. Doctor, no, sorry. Kim, I think we, we're on for the next 10 minutes with um, someone else at this point. Uh, yeah. Dr. Baldav, um, you are, Bernard is in, in transit and unable to connect. So okay. I think you are the, our host, I, our, our moderator. Our moderator at this point, okay. I think we could go on at this point to Hank, who raised the question, what, do you, what should he talk about? I think we could show his movie, right? Oh, wait, hang on, wait, don't show it yet. I'll, I'll tell you when, okay? Okay. Um, so my name is Hank Rogers. Um, uh, gosh, it's now 15, 17 years ago, I had a near-death experience and uh, found my missions in life as a result. My first mission, uh, is to end the use of carbon-based fuel, which I've since expanded, but let's talk about that mission for a moment. Um, I was living in Hawaii at the time. I still have a big presence in Hawaii. This is my home in Hawaii, uh, and that's the Milky Way. Um, <clears throat> we uh, started the Blue Planet Foundation, working to end the use of carbon-based fuel, and my background is I'm a computer game designer, so I had no idea how to go about this. Um, started the, the foundation fast forward, uh, we had our big breakthrough in uh, 2015, where we uh, managed to get Hawaii to have a mandate of 100% renewable energy by 2045. Uh, 2045 was a negotiation between us and the politician, but guess what? Hawaii is on track because we also changed the business model of the utility so they make more money by switching to renewables. And I remember clearly being on a, on a panel uh, and I, I said, we're going to go 100% by 2045. And this uh, person sitting next to me said, I'm a professor at the University of Hawaii. This is what I study for a living. There is no way we're going to achieve 100% by 2045. I'm going, what do I say to that? And I, what I said was, well, I'm not as smart as that guy. So we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> what? Guess what? Hawaii is on track. Hawaii is on track. Um, now the foundation is sort of uh, on its own. It's making sure that Hawaii actually does everything that it said it's going to do. The uh, utility has announced that they can do this by 2040. They are acting like they're going to do it by 2035. So the goal of 2045 is a really good goal because it just started the ball rolling and then put the right incentives in place. Um, that's mission number one. And I've expanded that mission. I'll get back to that in a moment. Mission number three is to make a backup of life by going to other planets. And uh, so, of course, the nearest object that we can actually move to is the moon. So that's got to be our first target. Second tar target's got to be Mars. The next target's got to be an exoplanet near some star that's within new technology distance of, of where we are now. Um, 
but to go to other planets and live on other planets, we have to practice. So um, I, I started, um, I created this uh, habitat on Mauna Loa called the High Seas, and now you can play the video. Oh, I can play the video. Okay, just a moment. I don't know how good this works on Zoom. I've got to, um, I think this is a session. <clears throat> We did nice. five missions with NASA. Uh, six people stay in 1,200 square foot of. Uh, Let me stop this. <laughs> okay, now I got to share a screen and then we go back to the movie. All right. Okay. I... Where's my share screen? Right here. Well, there's no sound. You, you have no sound? No. I have sound. Lucky you. <laughs> no, no, you I, I don't understand. Okay, let me, skip the video. Let me wind her back. Let's just skip the video. It's not that important. Okay. It, it really isn't that important. Uh, okay, let me stop share then. Yeah, okay. I'll just change my background. <clears throat> All right. So um, six people stay in 1,200 square foot of dome, practice living on Mars. That was the first five missions which we did with NASA. If you go outside, have to wear a spacesuit. If they communicate with the outside world, we delay that signal 20 minutes each way. So for all intents and purposes, you are isolated. The group is isolated. And we did uh, five missions, four months, four months, eight months, 12 months, and eight months. Um, Basically, my pitch is that we have to continue doing this. We have to prepare ourselves psychologically for being able to live on other planets. The, the, the voyage to the moon is three days out, and you can stay as long as you want and three days back. But the voyage to Mars is eight months to go, six months to wait while the Earth comes around, and then another eight months to come back. That's 22 months, and there's no resupply, and there's no second chance. You know, the next window comes two years later. So um, um, it's a very harsh condition and we need, to, we need to practice. So we practice here on Earth. I would really like to build a bunch of moon-based slash Mars-based pressurized prototypes also in the similar terrain. The, the reason we chose this terrain is it's the most similar to the moon and Mars. It's, it's mostly regolith. It's red because we have oxygen and it gets oxidized, the moon and Mars. Mars is oxidized, so it's the same. Uh, moon doesn't have oxygen, so it's not oxidized. But the chemis chemicals are the same. And we have lava tubes, so we explore lava tubes. And for those of us who want to live in lava tubes, they can find out what that's like. Um, so why go to live in another planet? Why, what's the point there? And my daughter asked me that because uh, my daughter said, why do you want to go to another planet? It's like, we've done such a terrible job of taking care of this planet. You know, why, why should we be allowed to go and ruin another planet? And my explanation to her is, is like, okay, there are 100 billion stars in this galaxy alone. And there's some, something like five planets average around each planet. That is, you know, that's a lot of planets. Just imagine there were grains of sand. You're on an on a almost infinite beach. And one of those grains of sand is, has a green smudge on it. And this green smudge is life as we know it. What's wrong with making a green smudge on another grain of sand? In the scope of things, it, it's, it's nothing. And there's nothing we can do to the moon or Mars to mess it up. I mean, it's, there's nothing there. There's no life there. All right, so um, back to Earth. I'm gonna switch back to Earth because mission number one, and, uh, and Vid told me to talk about my other mission too, See, where's my uh, mission number one is to make, uh, is to fix this planet. <laughs> In fact, our job is to terraform this planet. You know, if we, it's like some aliens come here and said, you know, I like a warmer planet and they're terraforming it in, you know, to be whatever they like. But guess what? We have to ter terraform this planet. And what do we have to do to terraform this? Well, first of all, we have to stop making carbon dioxide. That's just one of the obvious things. 
so I set myself a deadline, moved to New York to work with uh, the United Nations and with other countries. Um, we want to achieve not only 100%, it means uh, renewable energy by 2045, which we are on, by the way. We're helping island countries uh, come up with the same mandate and the same business strategy that we did in Hawaii. Uh, hopefully, what will happen is what happened in this country. After we did Hawaii, 12 other states and territories copied our legislation. That includes New York, uh, uh, Illinois, and, and California, which is half the population of this country. So half the population of this country is ready to go 100% by 2045. When I start flipping islands and that starts moving around the world, I would like all the countries in the world to have a mandate and then start thinking about how we do this. But uh, how, do we, how do we actually achieve you know, the, the, the big mission, you know, terraforming the planet, fixing it. And uh, there's more to it than just energy. There's plastic in the ocean, there's, uh, there's refrigerants, there's all kinds of things that we have to think about that, that, that are not like on the top of mind. So I, I decided, and I talked to NGOs, other NGOs who want to fix the planet somehow, what is the mission? So we created a mission that, that encompasses everyone. And the mission is to create a world in which humanity and nature live in harmony. Full stop. We need to do this by 2045. If we don't have a deadline, it's never going to happen. And by the way, this is the same mission that we have to have on every other planet that we ever go to. Wherever we go, we have to learn how to live in harmony with nature. So we have the SDGs, which are the Sustainable Development Goals that end in 2030, and it's a 15-year cycle. The next set of goals are going, to, are going to end in 2045, the 100th anniversary of the United Nations. I'd like them to be the regenerative development goals. I'd like us to put back everything we've taken, and I'd like to, us to fix everything that we've broken. And we can do this by 2045. We have all the technology we, we need right now to do this. So that's my uh, spiel. Back cool. to you. Okay. No, I don't have a script. I guess I could just go to the next person in line. Um, Adriano, are you ready? Okay, I'm mute to start video, share my screen. <clears throat> share. And okay, you can see. I can see. Okay, Thank fine. You. So, uh, okay, so this is the overview of my presentation. Uh, are the 17 SDGs an unfeasible utopia? Is my question. And uh, how to transform the utopia in an utopia? Utopia is a place that can be made, while Utopia is a place that doesn't exist and cannot be made. A part of our development within the boundaries of a planet Earth would be dangerous for civilization and for the environment. The civilian space development perspective is the only possible sustainable development. So this is the concept. Uh, looking at the agenda, the 17 goals, we can uh, uh, note that there are three goals that are, uh, let me say, most relevant with respect to the other goals. Uh, the seventh, the eighth, and the ninth goal. Affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure. These goals are key, or let's say the pillars to sustain all the, of the other goals. However, <clears throat> as we have a, a, a look at what we are doing or trying to do, uh, we can observe that civilization uh, can, uh, so, uh, can survive and continues to progress without paper. But as, as, uh, uh, as long as we will renounce to paper, we will increase the electricity consumption. And of course, paper uh, cannot be abandoned for in, in all cases. So this guy is reading his newspaper on uh, sitting in the toilet, it can, of course, do the same thing 
reading on a, on a laptop, but cannot do <clears throat> other important things by, uh, by means of a laptop. So, okay, paper, we still need paper, but this is just a, a joke, let me say. So the important thing is that uh, the less we use paper, the more we will need electricity. And this is an important problem, very important. So I have reorganized the, the, the SDGs, uh, putting on, on, the, on the ground the three pillars, energy, economic growth, and industry, and that is industrial development. On the second floor, I put the human life, social issues, so no poverty, no hunger, etc. On the third floor, the planet Earth environment, and on the top, methodology, that is peace and uh, partnership and responsible consumption, and so on. The point is, is all of this coastal sustainable? Can we, can we go ahead developing these goals on Earth? My uh, observation is that the three pillars goal, energy, economic growth, and industry, and industry will crash with the environmental goals. The conflictual factors, or not just the main, but there are many, Energy demand that will increase by web society and electric mobility, scarcity of key materials, rare earths, raising new resources, wars and conflicts, pollution increased by disposal of batteries and technological wastes, oceans over exploitation and pollution, social issues increased by multiple crises. So the only way to realize the 17 sustainable development goals is to add an 18 goal that is civilian space development. This is the key sustainability factor to support all the rest of the SDGs. So the key word is sustainability. The only sustainable development for 8 billion people is beyond the limit of this planet. We have to think about that. When somebody say that we can do something for free, free of charge, this is a lie. Because if somebody makes something free of charge, it means that he's stalling something to someone else. This is a balance uh, law of, of uh, nature in, 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 any, in any system, in any ecosystem, this is true. Expansion is indispensable to avoid any the growth is drift. The growth would kill human freedom, culture, and social nature. Confined in a cage, democracy will be crushed among nationalism, sovereignism, and neo-authoritarian feudal powers. An extraterrestrial society shall begin to exist. The horizon of expansion will restart social growth, hope in the future, and civil growth. The space diaspora brings many benefit, benefits. First of all, survival of civilization. Mother Earth could draw her breath by the beginning of this process. The children of Earth are ready for their primary school, as a craft uh, called Development Stage 1 on the Moon. When children grow up, they start moving out of home, and the mother gets young again. So civilian space development will contribute to the SDGs in several ways. Energy, progressive relocation of the industrial development to the geolunar space will restrict the energy demand on Earth's surface to the one of private citizens. Social growth, development of the civilian astronautic industry will raise economy at double figure, business opportunity and employment accordingly. Peace and collaboration, wars for resources will be delivered to history, losing their main cause. Environment, the environment of planet Earth will be relieved of the burden of industrial development. And cosmic safety, extraterrestrial development will mitigate the risk of premature extinction of our species by cosmic accidents. So expanding civilization is a global, globular uh, concept. Not a point-to-point -point round trip exploration, but a global expansion. And this could be the anthroposphere in the geolunar system with regular connections and uh, regular infrastructure for fueling, for uh, uh, tourism and so on. So we are at the recommendation, three last uh, slides, and I, I took inspiration from the, for, from the, the title of the 
International Astronautical Congress 73 that just finished in, in Paris a few days ago, that is a space for all. So this is a goal, of course, it's not a reality yet. What to do to make it a reality? Uh, space for all is a fin financial issue. Some, uh, many people think that uh, uh, allowing everyone to go to space is a, a problem of money. That is not true. It is a scientific and political challenge. It is paramount important to move first meaningful, meaningful steps of civilian space development before 2030. Political leaderships need to adopt a coherent strategy, a steps roadmap, and science needs to overcome some serious challenges. So these are the most important goals uh, to, to be uh, advanced uh, before 2030. Fully reusable, safe, and ergonomic vehicles for civilian passengers and cargo transportation in space. Producing fuel in space from moon and asteroid resources. Removing orbital debris and their reutilization as in situ space resources. Building logistic infrastructures and habitats in orbit and air moon Lagrange points endowed with simulated gravity. Moon and asteroid mining to get materials for space infrastructure construction, sustaining the new space industry worldwide by grants and fiscal reduction. Training and education collaboration between space agencies and private enterprises to share the best practices. Sustaining the space tourism industry and market segment, currently the only sector trying to transport and train at civilians in space. Help the non governative organization to spread their, spread their philosophical contribute to space community since there's no strategy without philosophy. So the, space, the science challenges enabling life, enabling life in space, because living and working in space is totally different from short exploration scientific missions. The mission requirements are different, particularly with respect to human health. There's a number of scientific issues which need better consideration and priority. It is our main recommendation to the UN that such research strains, as well as the above mentioned space strategy, will be promoted in every context where strategic decisions are undertaken. First, protection against sun and cosmic radiation, necessary to allow long time and permanent residence in space. Simulated gravity, necessary to avoid quick change of human physiology, giving the freedom to space settlers to go back to Earth when they like so. Green environment and water in space, necessary to assure an environment similar to the earthly one for biological and psychological needs. Low cost space transportation systems for civilian passengers and cargo, low acceleration and safe and comfortable atmospheric reentry mechanism. So last one, the last recommendation, expansion into space is a path of hope. Any pre-Copernican earthbound strategy will not bring again the hope in the heart of people. In a transterrestrial world, many social and environmental goals will be very much improved. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender quality, climate, life below water, life on land. This will be the ultimate utopia. Yet the most important condition will be greatly achieved. People will have hope and projects to work for. And this is the real difference. Please note that the transterrestrial concept is due to Dr. Marie-Louise Heuser. It is the head of the uh, Space Renaissance Philosophy Laboratory. Uh, okay, I'm done. If somebody wants to join the Space Renaissance, just use this QR code and go to the registration form. Thank you very much. Hello. We'll go on to our next speaker, um, Kiran. Are you ready? Yes, I will share my screen. Just a moment.
can everyone see the screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Kiran Gautam. Over here, I'm going to present the vision of the young lunar explorer. With space science technology, the first question appears in mind is, how will space science technology benefit humanity and sustainable civilian development? The evolution of space science technology started with curiosity, led to the explorations. It Every time it fetched us each step closer day by day to understanding our own home earth. And also it not only leads to the understanding or know about our earth, but also find out the possible solutions which is required and necessary for our existence and also for the deep space explorations. And the examples we can see nowadays is earth monitoring satellites, which prove to be critical for studying the climate change. And also when we see to the biological field over here, I want to focus more on how it is fascinating to see our understanding of cellular damage induced by high levels of cosmic radiations. And it could lead uh, to understanding, like advanced under, uh, development of our technologies and understand how uh, the different ways, how it could uh, affect our human body and advance our technologies for cancer treatment using high energy particle accelerators which similar to those encountered in space. Over here, I would like to first introduce myself. I'm Kiran Gautam, and I am studying my uh, master's in molecular biology in Bel and doing my thesis in Belgian Nuclear Research Center. And I have participated in one of the analog astronaut missions in Empole 11. And this is my crew. Each of us are young lunar explorers coming from different backgrounds of science and all are contributing to us the research for the lunar space in a different ways. And I will show in the following slides how I'm trying to bridge molecular biology with space sciences. This is the interesting question every time people pose. How, how are you connecting the molecular biology with space sciences? Over here, this is the project which I am doing in my Belgian, in the master thesis in the Belgian Nuclear Research Center, where I'm trying to investigate the DNA damage and repair response in simulated spaceflight environment of skin cells, the fibroblast cells, where I'm targeting on three different factors, ionizing radiation, microgravity, and psychological stress, which is cortisol. These three factors are the important challenging factors when astronauts travel to space, they come across and helping uh, and studying this will help us to counteract them by developing good like radio protection devices and different counteractive measures. And the psychological stress particularly drew my interest. And hence to more study about the psychological stress, I participated in one of the analog astronaut lunar simulation in Poland, Analog Astronaut Training Center in Poland, where I have performed the st psychological stress studies. In this slide, I have performed psychological experiments also, which was in combination with physiological and psychological feedback, where I have collaborated with Celia on the mood barometers and questionnaires targeting different stress and anxiety parameters, and also ECG movies and census with Sarah, one of my crew member. And with this, I obtained a good amount of data to study the psychological uh, response in the crew members in isolated and confined space. I have also used virtual reality to see how we can introduce virtual reality in confined and isolated space to study how we can psychological studies in the uh, space sciences. Also, I have uh, for, was fortunate enough to perform physiological experiments where I have performed urine analysis using spectrometry along with Jack, my crew member, where we we're targeting few stress markers, but uh, we can see over here in this graph, all of the six crew members who participated in mission under the same conditions, same diet and all the same environment, but we had a specific rise, a specific peak rise in one of the place in the width band. And we were really interested uh, uh, we are really intrigued and it's really interesting to study in detail what is this marker and it could really help us to
play a key specific role to identify as a biomarker for some a stress marker maybe. And also we had performed biological and chemistry experiments where studying the hydrogel and bacterial interaction along with my crew member Annette, where we have performed experiments uh, to produce, uh, to see how the different kinds of hydrogels with different composition had interaction, uh, had an interaction with bacteria and to study uh, the antibacterial properties of hydrogels, where we had used different kinds of microbial techniques. And this experiment helped us to know which hydrogel component had least number of bacterial growth. As hydrogels can be used in future in space field as uh, tissue remodeling and in repair process. And also uh, we have performed different sets of experiments from technical experiment to physiological, psychological experiments. So this, give, uh, this provided us young lunar explorers and ideal conditions, a good set of test bed to perform different experiments. That's one small step for a man, man one giant leap for a mankind by Neil Armstrong and Apollo 11. While I also believe Stepping the foot on the lunar surface or on the Earth's surface, each step counts and towards the space exploration, and it could lead to a tremendous changes in the understanding of deep space explorations and how it can help humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker will be uh, Pascal. Or do you want to be a summarizer? <laughs> you don't, your mic's not on. Hey, I, I just have to share my screen. Do I have uh, priorities? Yes, you do. Okay. Okay, give me a second. Okay, all set? Can you see my screen? Thank oh. you. Yes, we can see. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I'm coming a little bit from the space exploration side because I have uh, chaired a panel on Earth observation and sustainable goals. And I want to make um, a little bit of case how important space exploration is for the benefits uh, on Earth uh, concerning technology development, concerning international cooperation, concerning STEM education and also economic benefits. And we are living actually in a very, very exciting time of uh, space exploration. There have never been so many missions um, uh, venturing into the solar system. And um, uh, it is actually quite, quite fascinating what is happening. Um, I, I will focus, of course, a little bit on the low Earth orbit and the cis lunar and, and Mars environment. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we are not going beyond. Um, there are also many missions. but. I think uh, we have this kind of multi-stakeholder approach right now where space agencies uh, are working together with uh, entrepreneurs, uh, with industry and uh, particular startups um, in, in some kind of a, a really great synergy in order to um, um, design new missions. And um, it is very different than 10 or 15 years ago. So that's why we have actually many, many more activities in this new space area. And apart from uh, returning to the moon, uh, which has been already mentioned and looking at the surface, uh, um, uh, learning in pseudo resource utilization, uh, putting outposts um, and habitats um, and, and uh, trying you know, to prepare for going to Mars. Um, there is also a lot uh, going on in the low Earth orbit where we are in some kind of a transition phase where uh, we have currently still the International Space Station, uh, which will be active probably until 2030. 
Uh, and we have a really a new space station, the China a space station, we will we'll talk to in a minute. But um, we have a transition phase in a way that we will have um, many or one or two or many, we don't know, commercial space stations, which will uh, be um, um, uh, probably um, available for many of us, not only restricted to some astronauts or researchers, but, but for society at large. And uh, obviously we want to go to Mars um, with humans, but that will still take some time because we will have to do a lot of research in order to overcome radiation and uh, material science and, and, and health problems um, of, of, of humans in this environment. So we are also venturing very far outside in the solar system. Many of the moons in our solar system are very, very exciting and may have a life. And um, we are also going even beyond in order to look uh, for exoplanets. And these are more than 5,000 which have been registered and catalog cataloged uh, right now. And there are many, many more. So in generally, it is a very, very, it has never, space exploration has never been so dynamic and, 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 and active. And um, when we look at, uh, into the future of low Earth orbit, there are many companies right now which are planning space stations, which are actually really also for society at large, for space for all, as has been mentioned before, because they are trying to um, um, already design. Um, uh, we just heard at the space conference, Hilton will help to design uh, uh, one of those space stations. I think the one from, from Nanoracks. Uh, in order to have leisure quarters, medical quarters, so that uh, many people can go there and not only uh, restricted to astronauts or uh, researchers doing research there. It should be a commercial uh, part. It should be um, an inspiration for, for students and young people. And uh, it should, also, of course, also be for science. And so this is a completely new age where we develop a lot of technologies um, uh, which will be brought in in um, in lowest orbit. Not all of those space stations will succeed, but we hope that there will be at least two in the next decade uh, or where we can do um, research and co on commercial activities in this uh, lowest orbit and then later on in the cislunar space. So China has just um, uh, constructed in record time um, uh, the China Space Station, and they are looking for international cooperation. So international cooperation has an important uh, stride uh, for, um, and this is also one, uh, of course, of, 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 of the UN uh, measures. And um, uh, although uh, uh, this is the China Space Station um, uh, 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 instruments and also um, measurements and, and experiments are supposed to be done in international cooperation there. And it is extremely rapidly built in a few years. Um, and um, um, there are many crew members now on board and uh, uh, there will, will be add, adding new laboratories in order to do microgravity research. So um, we have also this big boost of space tourism. Uh, and, and last year, it was uh, this year, it was really, really exciting to having all those space entrepreneurs venturing into space, being in the 80 or 100 kilometer. Um, and uh, certainly this is an inspiration for, for everybody. And though it has been a little bit, uh, <clears throat> I would say unfairly, um, uh, criticized, uh, we have to start somewhere and it can only work out like this by testing a lot of those missions in order to make it uh, available for, uh, for a society. So, and our really big venture right now is Artemis. Um, <clears throat> uh, the launch is not happening on next Tuesday, but it will happen. And we are all waiting for the launch of Artemis 1. Uh, being the first step and the highlight of the Artemis mission to uh, for a long term presence of humans on the moon, but also uh, to build a lot of infrastructure in international cooperation. And when we look on, um, uh, on Mars, there are so many missions which are uh, uh, there right now from the United Arab Emirates, uh, from uh, Europe, uh, from um, from the US, uh, from China, 
there are so many different missions uh, which are currently exploring Mars, um, and they actually really work in international cooperation. And when we go further, a Mars sample return will only be possible in international cooperation. And when we actually go with uh, humans into deep space, <clears throat> there is a lot to do, which we have to manage in international cooperation. So I want to end with um, this uh, perspective of uh, international cooperation being a really important, <coughs> excuse me, a really important platform for international cooperation. There is, for instance, the International Space Exploration Coordination Group, ISEC-G, which is a forum of, of 26 space agencies or 24, I think it's 26 by now. And they are really working together in order to form um, you know, uh, coordination, what are the next missions to exploit worldwide expertise and of course also to reduce the cost by not duplicating. And uh, apart from that, the isaac -G has looked really at the benefits uh, for society of space exploration and among these parameters is always scientific discovery and a technological discovery, uh, we develop a lot of technologies for the future, which are also for benefits on Earth. And um, we um, uh, really um, uh, inspire the young generation. You have just seen one uh, uh, member current of, 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 of the young generation, how important that is for uh, their future careers and how they are actually inspired by this kind of research. And, um, I want to close with <clears throat> the fact that um, going so dynamically into space, we really have also to try some sustainability. And there is a very nice paper by McKinsey 2022. And here we really see um, how, uh, what kind of parameters we have to look that we do not do the same mistakes in space than on Earth. And I'm going to stop now because my voice is leaving me. <laughs> Thank you very much. I guess we'll move on. We have, um, I guess we could switch to Agata. Am I correctly pronouncing your name? You're uh, you don't need to pronounce the last name. Thank you. Uh, yes, I will try to share my screen. Uh, let me check. I should be right here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see uh, now. Let's do the, the full screen. We can, can see, see the full screen. We see it. Okay, super. Uh, so yes, I wanted to uh, add also some uh, parts of this uh, nice discussion. I wanted to add uh, something from Analog Astronaut Training Center, how we can educate can people. You, can, may I just interrupt you? Can you go on full screen mode? Because we see- I'm trying, uh, okay. yes. Yeah. Uh, I yes I to um, basically okay. show the program, then the other slides disappear. Um, uh, now you can see everything nicely. Yeah. This is great. Oh, oh, fantastic. Uh, yes, so um, I would like to add something from the point of mother of four kids and how to uh, sustain uh, the development of civilization here on Earth and uh, beyond. Um, so I will start from, um, from our experience. We try to show space in practice. And this is the main, uh, the main uh, things what we do. We try to show people how harsh is space, how extreme environment is space, and how lucky we are that we live on this planet. So apparently now we already trained 240 students, a little bit more, and um, we described all uh, analog simulations that we performed in more than um, 50 publications. We Actually, we performed 51 expeditions. They were either one week or two weeks long. You can see here the mission patches of this, um, of this international 
interviews, I mean, international missions. And first, I would like to say what is a space analog mission. Uh, very often, people don't understand what means analog. We understand that analog mission is analogous to the space mission, for example, in the spaceship or in the future base on the moon or base on the Mars. So we can divide uh, different types of analogous missions, uh, simulating different kinds of environments and conditions. And of course, there are some open field campaigns, uh, there are controlled field campaigns, and we are especially focused on controlled isolated campaigns, controlled campaigns inside the uh, habitat, which is a simulator of a spaceship. Our habitat is very, very small. It is uh, 57 square meters big. And uh, here we uh, perform missions uh, to simulate very interesting uh, phenomena that occur with human body, with human behavior, and uh, with all organisms that we put inside this isolated area. What I mean by isolated, it is that there are no windows, uh, doors cannot be opened easily. Uh, these are airlocks and there is a special, special procedure to open uh, the habitat. Then, of course, all our analog astronauts that we name our participants of the mission, they perform specific experiments that are simulated um, uh, to, to the conditions that may be on the moon or on other celestial bodies. And of course, they need to perform the specific procedures that usually real astronauts do on international space station. Our habitat is a very special place. It is uh, fully monitored with environmental sensors. We use uh, net atmos sensors. And it is very important that we monitor not only each module of the habitat that you can see the plan here on the bottom of this slide, but we also do a 3D mapping of environmental conditions. This means that in each module, we have several sensors at the height of one meter and two meters height. This gives us very interesting uh, 3D map of environmental parameters. Also, our habitat is specialized in simulations of extreme situations. For example, either uh, elevated carbon dioxide levels that you can see here, or we are trying to correlate several situations with actual space weather that you can um, see using internet, the spaceweather.com. Uh, it is accessible to everyone, but not many people um, get an idea where to find information about solar activity. So I believe that this is kind of interesting, especially uh, when we teach our students, our participants of the mission, that space weather is something very important, not only for um, some, some um, satellites, some missions in space, but also we as the uh, terrestrial species, we are also a part of the universe and we also should be sensitive somehow, uh, should screen the space weather. And here you can see uh, some trainings, some procedures that analog astronauts do during the uh, simulations. For example, we simulate meteorite showers, or we, we ask them to measure the uh, gamma, um, beta, and alpha uh, ionized radiation, or uh, we, we ask them to, to draw a plan of the habitat without using vision in complete darkness, in complete blackout. The most important thing that we do, um, it is not only showing the practical aspects of extreme conditions of extreme situations, but also we try to standardize our analog simulations. And after each mission, we generate a new database, uh, which is very nice to compare uh, one mission to another mission. And this is, I think, kind of unique. Uh, here you can see basic parameters uh, collected from 12 analog simulations. They were uh, one week long, but some data were collected 
only uh, from six or five days you can see. And we of course have different numbers of participants, our analog astronauts, different types of diets, but also these diets are very standardized. Um, they are always the same. Uh, what is kind of interesting, we observed uh, students, uh, they changed their uh, lifestyle, their behavior after one week of simulation in our habitat. It is because they have a limited access to water. It means that they have five liters of technical water per person per day and two liters of drinkable water per person per day. We monitor how much they drink, how much they urinate, and we try to see the balance of the water inside the isolated system. Also, we try to see how isolation influences stresses, influences uh, subjective time perception. We write several mobile applications that can gain not only data from our fully controlled conditions inside the habitat, which is in fact a laboratory to run studies on humans, but we also try to collect, to enable uh, using these applications for um, all population of uh, living on this planet. So to gain uh, citizen science data. Besides citizen science data, we try to, um, of course, to, to show how gravity uh, or rather altered gravity conditions change life, change living organisms to get an idea for our participants, how gravity is important. Also, we try to, um, to show what can be um, a replacement for plastic, what can be a replacement for all um, products that are polluting our planet, they, that need uh, very complex resources. So for example, here you can see a kombucha brewing, which is a fermented tea in, um, a very specific and only artificial, only uh, artificially made by humans uh, consortium built out of bacteria and yeasts. It appears that on top of this uh, fermented tea, bacteria produce cellulose, which can be freely used as a as cloves, for example, or as as I told you, um, um, replacement of plastic or replacement of some packaging materials. And this is fully natural, fully biodegradable, fully ecological. This can be done by each person at home in the kitchen. It does not require any sophisticated laboratories. Also, this natural product made by bacteria, it can be used for 3D printing. Uh, here in uh, Krakow, I collaborate and I work also in a space technology center. We already elaborated a uh, method of 3D printing using these uh, bacterial nanocellulose mixed with some cellulose or some uh, lunar regolith simulant. And here also I wanted to say that we collaborate with uh, Space Technology Center in a way that we are building a new habitat, which will be another place to run um, comparative studies between the habitat that we have at AATC. And uh, this uh, will also allow students to get ECTS points to, to, to be involved um, in a regular um, educational programs at the university. Uh, here I also wanted to tell you that our students already, they elaborate um, using uh, bacterial nanocellulose to build some uh, composite materials, also ecological. Um, we try to use algae bioreactors to uh, reduce levels of carbon dioxide in isolated spaces. We try to elaborate easy uh, simple methods and safe methods of um, water recycle, of, of cleaning the water out of all pollutions. Uh, here uh, you can see uh, another student that is working on fertilization, sterilized uh, grounds, sterilized medias of rocks. Of course, plants cannot grow on the pure rocks. 
you need to give them nutrients, you need to give them bacteria, fungi. Very often we don't see how complex processes occur, how big ecological chains are related to the healthy plant growth. And this we can check in isolation because then we see what is needed. Then, of course, we are analyzing several um, processes under microscope. We have, as I told you, simple methods, and we try to teach to, to show our students how this harsh environment affects a real life. When they see it, they completely change their lifestyle, as I told you. And uh, considering uh, the climate changes and uh, monitoring of our planet, we also develop some alternative methods uh, for students to monitor climate from the stratosphere. It is super expensive to uh, build a satellite, a student satellite, and it, the, the limited number of students um, is not really uh, a big output out of uh, such a huge endeavor. That is why we uh, prefer much, much cheaper stratospheric missions where students still can monitor several interesting parameters of environment. And with that, I would like to thank you uh, for listening and of course, welcome for collaboration. Thank you very much. Okay, we go on. Uh, Armin, are you ready? Hello, David. Uh, yes, thanks uh, for having me. I think I'm ready. Let me check if you can see my slide. <laughs> can also share. Yes, I will try to yeah, uh, speak a bit uh, above my slides, which I've prepared for today because I was not really aware of where our discussion will bring us, let's say. So I don't see any more your video, but you can see my slide, correct? Yes, we can see it. Yeah, great, great, great. Okay, my name is Armin Wedler. I'm since uh, 14 years in uh, the German Aerospace Center and DLR in um, a institute um, yeah, dedicated to research topic or to, to specific research in robotics and mechatronics. And as uh, my prior speakers and also the introduction talk has already mentioned, I think uh, yeah, as far as I understood the session here, the, the sustainable development goals um, have a very important uh, impact for space development because we are we, we have very limited resources in space and we need to take I mean on Earth as well uh, Hank I think uh, spread it around a bit so we cannot abuse resources so the 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 idea in space is to be very efficient in everything you do and that's let's say what my my whole education career is uh, focused on and especially space developments are focused on. so what we are working in uh, the robotic development in the german aerospace center so dlr speaking for the german aerospace uh, research center we are trying to develop technologies and methods which are specifically designed of course for uh, our target problem uh, and the application case in that case space and we try to make that uh, in a very efficient and uh, yeah, productive manner, um, which fits, of course, uh, the, the general sustainability ideas. And I would try to give you an overlap of from what we come, or where my group and my team and some activities we have currently running within DLR um, are currently bringing technology, which we have developed initially for space, uh, to terrestrial application case to directly uh, work in sustainable development goals and work in humanitarian help. And I try to make this gap in 10 minutes, which is a bit of a challenge, but uh, yeah, we can probably talk about it later a bit. So we are coming from developing such rovers, such uh, systems for future space exploration mission. We are currently, we have already launched uh, technologies and little robots on asteroids. And we are currently looking for a Martian rover, uh, which we bring uh, with uh, two agencies, as also mentioned uh, again before uh, in space, we cooperate a lot with other nations. So we have a mission currently running where we bring a small robot, something like this size, so a 30 kilo robot uh, to Martian moon Phobos. Um, that will be launched in 24 and will probably land 26 um, 
this year. So we are uh, developing yeah, vehicles, let's call them rovers, uh, very efficient electronic drives, uh, very efficient power management systems. And since we have the challenge in space, uh, we're also developing a lot of autonomous functionalities to work and, and function in harsh environments. That enables us, for example, to autonomously detect stones or point of interest uh, and, and, and kind of uh, yeah, scientifically relevant places. So we're doing that to, um, Hank mentioned it, to extend uh, our possibility uh, for future bases, so extend the, the footprint, extend the, the, the habitational places for humanity. But of course, also we want to understand much more about our solar system. Um, that uh, gives us a lot of questions up um, and, and we would like to answer them. So that's why we are dedicated to scientific questions. We try to take samples and, and collect soil, bring it back to Earth to analyze it further. Or we have instrumentations, uh, in situ instrumentations on top of the robots, uh, which can uh, be used um, and as uh, scientists uh, on place. And we always want to have an operator or a scientist uh, in the back. So we are not envisioning the autonomous future wall. So that's uh, uh, an idea um, which we, we, we like to enhance autonomy to enhance the capabilities of our, um, um, of our human activities. So we would like to support always an operator uh, with uh, such GUIs and such uh, corporations. Doing this video you see here, that's uh, from an analog mission we did, uh, which brings us also the link to the prior stalker, uh, where we have been uh, this year, June, July, with 50 people and uh, yeah, a lot of nations uh, together and uh, three organizations within the Helmholtz Association, but also ESA. Uh, we have been together on, on Mount Etna uh, and we cooperate in this Arches project here uh, together with Deep Sea. So we cooperate with um, also challenges from uh, robotics underwater. Um, that's where we come from. And uh, now we have a challenge uh, in, in house where we try to uh, transport the technologies we once developed. And I think that's really sustainable to use it on Earth in a humanitarian context. And we have a cooperation here with the World Food Program. Um, so um, in the moment, Unfortunately, we can see them um, much more recent uh, in every news, uh, every evening. So it brings me also that this project here, um, I'm very dedicated to, and I have to also say that all the teams, we have seen it uh, about the motivation of people. I can really commit that there's 200 people in our Robotic Institute. I think that's a project where the most people would like to work for because they really see the need and they're really highly motivated. Space is already highly motivating, but I think sustainable development goals can even bring us further. So the idea of this autonomous humanitarian emergency at device is just to bring technologies we have in PLR in-house from space together uh, to sustain, uh, to sustain uh, food delivery of the World Food Program. So the idea here is to protect divers from um, expose them to danger and humanitarian uh, air transports. We want only to focus on the challenging part on the last mile delivery of such uh, trips, which is a challenge. And um, I have uh, many use cases currently um, evaluated with the World Food Program, but also with other humanitarian um, help organizations, NGOs. Uh, we want to um, extend the possibility of the World Food Program, and that's needed, as mentioned before, as we hear it, uh, that has economical reasons, but of course also ecological reasons. The idea here is to have an um, autonomous or yeah, a, a data asset um, for um, um, satellite overview pictures, but also um, uh, unmanned vehicles or any kind of air uh, picture. We're going to bring them together in a control room, such like a GMOC here, a, a Houston, uh, where we collect all informations. And we have a local operations center from where on we operate our last mile delivery fleet of, of trucks. Um, and we have many relay stations in, in place. And, and we also envision that uh, the system uh, is equipped with a truck uh, on top, which can then um, go and work together. So in space, we have that already. So we have a control room. We have it even in DLR on our booth in, in uh, near to Munich and Oberfaffenhofen, which is a, a mission operation center from there. The overall mission will be controlled. The, the, the drones on the, on the air can be uh, steered or controlled to get aerial images, but also the satellite imagery can be acquired there or are already available there. 
um, the, the local mission operation center is something like we would like to bring uh, to our place. And from there on, we remote uh, control and operate the vehicle. And um, having that, we might involve also a communication asset and we, we, we need to bring communication to the system. And we need to, let's say, find the tailor operate such a vehicle. And as you can see here in the picture on the top, uh, the, the, the World Food Program is currently using this vehicle. So the, 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 the choice of such a vehicle, which is capable of swim and drive. So it's a um, Ukrainian uh, company which produce uh, this uh, very old military uh, vehicle, which is very, yeah, very similar to a vehicle we're using or we're developing for planetary exploration. So it has skid steering, so no real steering wheel. Um, yeah, and it's very rough terrain capable. So we, we, we like a lot of the sheriffs, uh, which World Food Program have brought to us. Initially, we didn't want it, them to automatize them, but now we are very happy and we are very convinced. Uh, to have uh, an overview of the near uh, environment, even the World Food Program, currently a picture from South Sudan here, you can see, uh, is using um, drones, uh, which uh, fly out of the window uh, from the vehicle. So our idea is to have an autonomous drone in uh, in vicinity of the vehicle, which we can land on top of the vehicle. So I will go roughly on the technology, and I will just don't make it too 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 complicated here because I, I thought it's good to have some AI uh, topics inside. But I think we are capable of of closing the loop between uh, perception and uh, actu actuation to have a slam running, so we can autonomously map our environment. We can control this. We have a mission control which is running safe the system. Uh, and we can still invent or incorporate with uh, with mission uh, scenarios. Um, the the car is currently uh, at our booth, and we are equipping it. So we have the, had the first drive test uh, a week ago, and we have already equipped it here, as you can see, with a lot of sensors. So we have a full 3D um, camera system, and we have also lidar system currently being mounted on top of this car, and we can do yeah autonomous detection of object, we want to mm, detect not, as you could see in the prior video, where we would like to look for stones, which are important for life science or any kind of other scientific um, questions on planetary surfaces. I think here we are looking for, um, we want to detect if this is either a stone or if it's in a, a, a plant. Uh, we, of course, want to or need to detect humans, um, and we need to distinguish uh, semantically between the environment that we're doing with AI methods as it is in our days in every world. But I think also in terms of energy consumption, we are very, very focused on functional models, which are solving very dedicated problems. So we are not too much into this end-to-end -end, uh, learning approach. We are involving our simulation, which we have for space, but you can see here down, uh, we already involved it and, and put SHARP on, on Mars uh, yeah, in virtual reality everything like this is possible. So you can drive around uh, for tests. Uh, so we have this space technology, which uh, is mainly dedicated for this aspect. And we, we, we bring it over to, to this technology. And uh, so this is the first test drives. And as you can see here, are levers on the, on the right side. Um, and we, yeah, we, we automatize these levers, but also we are now mainly focus, focusing on the, on the till operation of the beam. So I, I, I want to close this project and, and, and give you even a hint on, on, on another small activity with uh, the, the idea and the, the, the idea for the, how far we can go with this and, and being realistic. I, I think, I, I liked what Hank said. I mean, it's not possible in 35 days to change the world. Yeah, that's uh, in 35 years to change the world. That's probably the opinion of a, of a politician. I would say that, you need to do it, you need just to start, but you need to also to be clear in what can be achieved and what can be achieved in the, in the time frame, and, and, and to have realistic goals. So that's the mention. I just want to say that we have this research project where we bring a first prototype in the field and due to the, to the feedback I get from the people and the NGOs and other organizations and uh, the current state also in, in, in the environment, I see that that makes really sense what we're doing here. But I also I always need to tell people that this is only a prototype and that's the first one. Additionally, I will jump into a yeah, 
also a transfer um, um, project we're currently uh, afforded. And I will give you just a few overview to give you an idea, and maybe that's a fun for a discussion later, um, how robotics can also, let's say, be used. And, and that's a good thing of robotics. We are very flexible and, and robots yeah, might be needed on many parts uh, in cooperation with human. I think we can really be a beneficial um, um, productive uh, team here. Uh, so we, we acquired just this very big project in, in, uh, from the Helmholtz Association, um, which is about sustainable food uh, production. And we ad directly dedicate uh, this uh, five sustainable goals. So I was very much listening with my prior um, presenter, which explained the, the ranking of the different goals. So I, I think we are trying to dedicate this, let's say, high level goals here. Um, in, in the food supply chain um, and in the, in the food production chain uh, due to the fact that we would like to um, get more understanding and more real-time data of our status of an area. And we dedicated uh, this project to an area which is in Germany uh, in the East Sea in um, Schlei region where the, the East Sea is collapsing uh, in, in a yearly uh, repeatedly baseline so we can we can really um, observe and chemical um, um, overwhelming of, of the of the Baltic Sea, and we can uh, also realize that this is really man-made, and we would like to get more um, efficiency and, and uh, understanding in why this happened, and we would like to give also yeah proof on why this happened and and how this happened, and we would like to give uh, advisory. Um, um, advisory um, publications and, and, and documents and, and uh, put out results to get this uh, process um, be understood and be proved uh, in, the, in, in the way. And just roughly the, the, the idea or the problem of, of this region is that due to climate and, and weather, uh, soil infiltration from agriculture, a lot of, of uh, runoffs from the surface and from, from agriculture is currently transported uh, somehow in the sea and collects in the seabed. Uh, and this is mainly visible and observable in the coastal regions uh, where this, uh, yeah, where the, all this uh, sediment is, is uh, conductive and is uh, resulting in the collapse of the, of the area. And we would like to bring satellite imagery together with drone or aircraft imagery here and robots on the ground or in the area and deep sea robots uh, together to collect data and give us more ideas about, uh, yeah, about what is our actual situation. And this on a daily basis and on a 24 hour space. So the, the idea is to, to develop a network which is bringing this kind of information and data in a continuous manner. And this network is intelligent and uh, provable. So that's a technology description of uh, what, uh, yeah, only one institute, still our robotic uh, institute is currently developing to transform or to, to, to bring the technologies in the humanitarian field or to become, let's say, humanitarian, uh, uh, helpful, in uh, in our um, in our um, yeah, daily challenges, let's say. And within uh, with this, I would like to close also my I think a little bit extended talk. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> now we will go on and our. Um, next speaker is uh, Roxana. Are you there? Yes. Okay, sharing my screen. Do you see it clearly? Full screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. We, we're here. Thank you very much. So, um, I'm going to try to do a mix of uh, 
all the speakers that we've heard until now. Uh, but again, a, a bit from my point of view, um, as a teacher, okay, I became a teacher um, after a research doctorate in physical chemistry, um, passing through a scientific facilitator small career, and today I'm a space science and physics teacher at an engineering school in Toulouse. Friends, uh, former commander of the EMPO-1 mission. I got to told you about the analog missions and I'm gonna speak about it a little bit too. Co-organizer of 10 of these analog missions and still very passionate about space exploration. And of course, um, today I'm gonna talk from my point of view of what's engineering and preparing the next generation um, explorers. So um, my school, Institut Polytechnique des Sciences Avancées, uh, used to be aeronautics and space engineering school for almost uh, for more than 60 years already, uh, with a lot of student associations and strong international ties. But beginning with June 2021, our engineering school became one of aeronautics, space, and sustainable mobility. How did we uh, uh, start to get to, to that um, way? Um, we propose STEM and project-based learning. Our first and second year preparatory classes go through year-long projects. Uh, like uh, building um, a slider simulator or learning how to deal and treat space data, um, building um, a, a telescope uh, with associations and high school um, students, and then uh, creating them opportunities uh, like the one that we had thank to, thanks to the collaboration with Bernard Foing and with Lua Moon Mars. Um, this is an example of a joint mission, the scouting missions in Iceland that took place in 2020. And afterwards, you saw Agatha. Um, and together with Bernard and myself, we built the first and or co-organized the first EMPO mission, EMMPO mission, Roman Mars Poland, uh, in October 2020. So we started in, in June and we started preparing it and going from school projects to analog mission uh, experiments. So we took the project that our students prepared um, and we brought them inside the um, moon, uh, analog moon base in Poland. And of course, preparing them went through a lot of process like weekly international meeting, go on, going on conferences, preparing and organizing, uh, organizing workshops, talking, communicating is very important. And then as we were preparing an analog space mission, we also organized like an analog space mission with the flight director, with the communication between the mission control center and analog astronauts that went through a CAPCOM, um, dividing data produced by the analog astronauts um, and then uh, transmit it to, to the MCC crew and uh, then dispatch it through science, medical and data analysis. But what's more important is that inside um, the analog moon base, we put, we, we deal with aquaponics and hydroponics system that nowadays is a very um, important uh, deal because we have aquaponics and hydroponics farms that we use a small budget of water. We deal, of course, with life support, with reducing CO2 levels in confined spaces, with biocontamination while exploring, recycling, sample returning system, or again, wa uh, water budget and its pH. And you will see that through all this, uh, experiments that we deal with inside the moon base, we learn how to deal outside. So first um, we took an aquaponic and hydroponic system that was inside and uh, after two weeks, our students improved it and got beautiful crest uh, plants that you can see there. 
And then they simulated um, a power failure inside the habitat. So again, um, we were talking about uh, uh, energy budget. Here we have an example of no electrical consumption, very uh, small amount of energy. Uh, by simulating a failure, a power failure in the habitat, they managed to maintain maintain the health uh, of the plants, control the parameters, the pH of the the soil, um, the humidity, and the plants survived. Um, we were monitored, of course, by the Mission Control Center, and we were mostly important monitoring the CO2 level as we were in a in confined space. You saw a lot of parameters that Agatha already um, presented, but from our point of view, analog astronauts and teacher, uh, what's important is that uh, my vice commander made an algae-based bioreactor to lower the CO2 levels. So he put together uh, three different algae microconsortia and he had results in one week uh, lapse of time, he lowered in uh, in uh, two rooms the level of the CO2. We deal with uh, recycling and co uh, compost too, um, uh, in collaboration with environmentally friendly French society. We had gloves, wet towels, and garbage bags that were compostable. So again, uh, one, of our, one of our astronauts uh, measured the pH and uh, the temperature uh, um, as long as, um, and the humidity of the jars that were containing compost with wet towels and gloves in it. One week wasn't enough, but it was a start, the beginning of a study that will show us that even in confined spaces and mostly in confined spaces, we can deal with compost. Um, another issue was um, the sample return system, but because we only uh, invested competences that were uh, built in school uh, to the um, analog mission, but we can go through uh, the real um, space exploration with it. And while on on, on the moon, for example, we can 3D print a launcher. The technology exists already. We uh, have here the example of a high pressurized tank that was built under Katya and then 3D printed. Of course, this is a first uh, prototype, but we have a master degree that, were, that deals with the trust and the modeling of the entire sample return system. Um, water budget. Water budget is very important. And first of all, when we think about water, we think um, seven pH water, neutral pH water. But during our first ample missions, and we didn't stop there, we used a 9.4 uh, water, a pH water, and we tested its influence on the hydroponic and aquaponic system and uh, on the astronauts because we were drinking and cooking with this high uh, pH water. Um, we, of course, um, so um, we had, yeah, we monitored the water budget and uh, not only a lot of other parameters from the, from the mission, from the moon base and our moon mates. Um, we deal with uh, the problems of scheduling and communication between the base and uh, the mission control center, um, thinking about our needs in science, in dealing with all our tasks inside and uh, outside the MCC, the mission control center that we had one on site and one remote. Um, how can you, put all these brains together and work uh, for our mission to, to, to succeed. And of course, what we learned is that while we have a temporary loss of signal, like blackouts, like I've told you about the aquaponic system while uh, a power failure, but it happened with communication. It happened uh, with, um, having to deal with um, the adapting 
to adapting to a new environment because going to Poland inside a very unfamiliar environment was like going on the moon and dealing uh, in isolation conditions with all those tasks was very, very uh, hard. So uh, what we thought is that we should prepare longer than we already prepared, um, focus on science protocol and knowing each other, but mostly uh, we saw that we had to deal with reducing water and energy budget during our missions. And of course, as uh, engineering school, dealing a lot more with the sustainable engineering and awareness of the SDGs. Uh, um, what we uh, thought about also being isolated is that soft skills are as important as hard skills. Um, communicating about it also, so we had a number of, a, a big number of outreach events after our first uh, two missions. And we continued to uh, organize them. So here you have, because Agatha showed you all her missions, here is only what Euromoon Mars Poland uh, mission was uh, only the Euromoon Mars Poland mission that we organized. So we already did 11 missions together and we're going to the uh, 12th and 13th mission that will take place this October, 2022. What happened is that during this three years, we developed collaboration with a lot of structures, a lot of universities and why not the next step, it would be you. But every time taking in, into account our objectives that are taking care of what we explore and our planet. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much. I guess we will go on to our next speaker, uh, Adrian. Are you ready? Hello, Adrian. Hello, Adrian. I was going to speak, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, but I have well, to go. I think there has been a misunderstood. I'm not in the program, so I should be. Oh. Uh, okay, uh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can we'll give a speech. To, uh, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm not working from a script. I'm just uh, really looking at who's here. So, um, Sunil, I, I'm not sure if, no, you're not in the speaker list either, actually. We may be. Um, is and anybody... Paul's not in the speaker list, although I'd like to hear from. And there's Jim. My gosh. Um, yes. We're missing all of these speakers that that um, are here, who have managed to come to the session this afternoon, have spoken. We're missing oh. a couple of people, including Dr. Poing. Um, so I think I think you can open. Okay. For interactive discussion and. So we'll have, we, we can open for interactive discussion. I, I was in the speakers <laughs> from oh, the list. Okay. In, so, very good. Go. Thank yeah, you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Just sharing my screen. All right. Can you see it full screen? Yes. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's uh, great to be here with you today. I'm Serena Crotti and I'm an Italian designer. I recently graduated from Politecnico di Milano School of Design, and I'm also now working as press officer from, for Lunex at Moon Mars, uh, which was founded by Bernard Point. Okay, so um, today I'm here to represent the working space of the generation of young lunar explorers together with Kiran. And for this reason, I decided to talk to you about a personal project, uh, which I developed together with Euromoon Mars in the context of my thesis work at Politecnico di Milano. 
And this project had as its main goal and purpose the facilitation of research for young people in the area of aerospace. And it is intended in general as a solution to two needs within the space context. So the first one is the need to develop strategies of cooperations between academia, agency, entrepreneurs, and young students. And the second one is the need to develop strategies to do better science at lower cost. So the project I'm going to present tries to address these two needs. Um, as I was mentioning, uh, it is part of a, of a wider research that I conducted at Politecnico di Milano under the academic supervision of professors Dominoni, Quacquaro, and Foyne. And in general, the goal of this project was the development of a transportable habitat, a module, to conduct uh, space mission simulations on Earth, which are basically analog missions in an itinerant way in different uh, research centers and academia all around Europe. Um, so before going more into detail about the project, I would like to briefly address the strategic role that terrestrial analogs play for young researchers in space. And in fact, the contributions of analog is not only crucial in preparing real astronauts before real missions, but it is strategic in a sense that it makes space research more accessible and more democratic, especially for young students and, and PhD researchers and in general, young researchers, I would say. Uh, that is because uh, analogs make it possible to conduct experiments in realistic simulation settings, as, as it was already um, addressed by previous speakers. And also because uh, they allow to test effects in space-like conditions on increasingly large samples of population, generally at lower costs and with reduced timelines, which is very useful for young researchers and young students. Uh, all this opens the door to young students in research in aerospace and the role uh, to be seen in a wider strategic pers perspective also regards the important, uh, let's say, contribution that analogs um, play for outreach activities because Analogs are often very, um, let's say, shown to the wide public and they contribute in creating somehow inspiration for young students to take part into missions and to commit to get an education in the aerospace field. So um, in general, uh, analogs maybe create space-like conditions in, in different ways. Some of them have a focus on confinement and some others have a focus on EVA. And today, I, uh, in my project also, in, uh, I personally focus more into the first type of analogs. So analogs that recreate uh, um, conditions in, in a realistic way inside a simula uh, simulated space basis. And on the left, you can see an overview of all the parameters that can be recreated in this kind of facilities. Um, thanks to the collaboration of Euro Moon Mars with the Analog Astronaut Training Center, I was myself able to get involved uh, into one, one experience as an analog mission. At that time, I was still developing my thesis and it was very useful because during uh, our mission, I was able to get a user-centered perspective as a real astronaut dealing with real problems. And that is really very important for design students. So I would also like to, I would like to shed light on the importance of, of analog research, not only for science, science students, and uh, aerospace engineer students, which is of course uh, what has been, has been told so far, but it's very important also for students in other fields as I was during the mission. I, I was a, a product design student dealing with a product design master's thesis. So uh, here you can see some shots that were taken during the mission. And uh, yes, my contribution during the mission was mainly focusing on habitability studies and I also performed a set of experiments that was um, somehow um, focused on increasing the astronauts' well-being uh, in confinement. Serena, yeah, um, this is uh, your technical person. Um, we are still on the first on the cover slide. Um, oh my god! <laughs> so I, I'm moving on. I don't know why. I can just restart sharing. Uh, that's weird. I will try. It seems like it's working now. No. Working. I don't know. Probably it was like the, the desktop was was freezing. <laughs> okay, I will just scroll to the previous slide so that you get at least an idea <laughs> of what I was mentioning. So can you see now? Yes. 
going on? All right, I'm sorry about it. I don't know what happened. Okay, so uh, yes, I was trying to show uh, the strategic role of analogs uh, for space research. So I hope that you could just <laughs> follow from my from my previous speech. And this is uh, like the contribution that analogs can play simulating confinement, as I was mentioning before. And here are some shots taken from the Ample 8 mission, uh, which is the one I was involved in as a researcher in, in design and for my master's uh, of science thesis in integrated product design at Politecnico. So I think that so far you could see now this is the new one. So <laughs> I will try to, to go on. All right. Um, so as I was saying today, I, I was uh, I, I would like to, to talk about this project, which is a personal project of the thesis and uh, which bridges academia, students and uh, researching space for young students. And the design uh, involved the, the yes, the, the project involved the design of Multiverso Hub which is a concept of an inno innovative uh, mobile base uh, where students can conduct analog missions all around Europe in different research hubs and academia. Um, let's say that uh, this analog and the concept itself, it's a sort of one in a kind analog, analog because it, it um, features three unique and distinctive aspects, um, which makes it different from existing analog facilities. So the first one is transportability. The second one is transformability of the interior environment. And the third one is the provision of ad hoc solutions to increase the astronauts' well-being. So transportability uh, is an effective strategy uh, in order to offer a wide range of scientific communities um, the ability and the possibility to conduct simulations without incurring in the cost and the time which are required to build a facility of their own. And in general, uh, another aspect which leads to the second uh, idea, which is the one of transformati transformability, uh, lies in the fact that this habitat uh, can be somehow adapted in its interior features, as you will see in the following renderings, um, to meet another need, which is using the facility for outreach and uh, outreach purposes, and not only for simulations. So let's say that flexibility is another feature of, of this uh, design or of this concept. So trying to give you some visual, um, this is um, how the module looks like when it is in phase of transportation. Uh, transportability was a challenge because we had to integrate all the systems inside the main core module. And those systems had to also allow, uh, allow um, the missions to be organized in uh, remote areas in isolation. So our challenge was to combine transportability with the possibility to organize missions without extra um, operations once on site. Another chance was, uh, an, an, another sorry, challenge was also to combine the need uh, of accommodating a crew of four, as it will be probably a crew of people to Mars, and also to include all the areas that are really needed to simulate in a proper uh, way life inside a, a moon base or a Mars base. The, which means also uh, including areas for training, areas for experiments, and also areas for common tasks and for private private tasks, let's say. Um, this is to give you an overview on the way in which the habitat transforms in, uh, itself from the um, uh, asset in which it can be transported on a 40 feet uh, standard container into a fully deployed habitat where the tractor can be detached and it becomes immediately operational with, with no need to uh, attach it to any external, let's say, um, sources. Um, regarding the scenarios of use, as I was saying before, this project is conceived for students uh, that are keen on developing their projects and their researches inside a simulator. And the idea is that uh, transportability makes it, makes it possible to organize this mission directly close to uh, academia or research hubs or in, when needed in more remote locations, like increasingly uh, the level of, of complexity of the simulations that can, that can be organized on board. Um, okay, so this is just an overview uh, on the main layout of the habitat. I will not go, of course, into detail because of time. I will simply uh, show you very quickly the areas that are um, conceived on board. So the main systems, which are the life support systems and also the monitoring system for um, 
for checking the onboard activities during the missions are all uh, in the main uh, core, which is the one you can see in the floor plan in the middle. And then uh, on the two sides, there are two conceptual areas. One is the working side where there is a space lab where we also envision in advance all the possible instruments and the space that those instruments would take once on board. A training area to simulate, of course, uh, exercise, physical training and physical exercise as it is already done in analog missions. And also storage areas for the space lab. On the other side, instead, there are uh, the crew quarters and the areas of kitchen and living, which are um, more into daily life uh, activities for, for the people on board. Uh, here you can see an overview on the living side. So uh, this features the kitchen, the living area, waste collection point, a toilet, crew quarters, and also food storage area. And as you can see, uh, the design choices that drove the process of designing of these interiors are um, quite different from, uh, from the actual analogs that already exist. In fact, uh, I built upon uh, the knowledge I developed at university on uh, space design and the need to create um, environments that are perceived as more friendly and more cozy by astronauts themselves during the missions. And a lot of uh, inspiration for the materials, for the color palette, and also for the textures on board were taken, uh, was taken from uh, the natural world in order to build uh, and to conceive an environment that was perceived as less uh, hostile, as less harsh uh, by the astronauts on board. So similar, similar um, reasoning just um, uh, was followed in the design of the area, which was, um, which was um, conceived for the working side. Here you can see uh, just a snapshot on the uh, space lab, and also um, which also features an hydroponics unit and also a fridge uh, to storage uh, fresh samples. And yes, and the training area is not visible in this view, but it's just imagine it on your like as if it was on your back. <laughs> um, finally, thanks to a flexible system of inflatable walls, uh, it is possible to divide these two environments and areas that I showed you before into uh, single rooms, uh, thus addressing the need um, of privacy and also sound insulation that is very important to allow the, st the students that will be on board not only to, uh, of course, uh, um, engage into communal activities, but also to study, to work, and to perform the experiment in an efficient way. Uh, last, as I was mentioning before, uh, this um, habitat, uh, this, yeah, this project uh, and this habitat in general is not only intended for space mission simulations, but also for outreach. And the idea is that uh, this uh, ha simulator could be used also to open it to the public and to allow visitors to get engaged into the possibilities of space research on board analog facilities. And the idea in this case was that of uh, somehow overlaying the reality of the analog environment to that of a space-like condition. So the visitors will be able to step on board and to take a tour inside the analog facility while watching through their visors or, or yes, through their visors of um, Microsoft HoloLens, uh, superimpose the uh, figures of uh, astronauts that were, would be performing activities and daily tasks in microgravity. And this is not only to give the visitors an idea of something like uh, cool, of, of, a, of a funny experience, but it's also uh, important to create uh, uh, somehow um, um, pleasant environment where visitors that are not very close to space research, research can, can be inspired and can also learn about the actual uh, conditions of astronauts life uh, in space. So I'm just, a at the end of my presentation, and I'm very sorry for the for the technical problem <laughs> before. Thank uh, you. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, we all technical difficulties happen. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Beldovs, um, Dr. Boing uh, has just notified me, or I've been notified that he will be joining us about four o'clock. So. In about seven minutes. Now, we don't have uh, 
Dr. Lee here from KIST, but uh, Adrian uh, Guzman is from that organization, and I think he does have the presentation, I believe. Adrian? Thank you very much, Vitnus. Uh, actually, I, I'm, I, I work for the Mexican Space Agency, but coincidentally, I was uh, watching this presentation and, and see that Dr. Lee is, is part of the panel. Uh, we work with um, um, with um, um, KIST, and um, we 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 have a small presentation that I I, I can make if, if if you allow me. Just let me see if I can activate it. I wasn't prepared. I can activate. Um, I'm going to re reboot Zoom in order to share. Just give me one second, please. Let's see. I think you're allowed to share or we can change that. Okay, all participants can share. Yeah, you're fine. Everyone is allowed to share. Oh, I guess he's getting his presentation, so we're We'll be waiting a bit. Hello, I don't know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. This is part of a collaboration we have uh, with the uh, kids key department um, in the Department of Future and Smart Construction Research. We are uh, developing uh, our second lunar mission in, at the Mexican Space Agency, which is a, a lunar rover. So I was going to ask you for uh, uh, to accept. Sorry, which is a, a collaboration and with Airbus and a Mexican startup. No, please. So this ahead. is part of the program <laughs> okay. we are uh, uh, doing let me, uh, with, uh, my... with the Korean Space Agency. And it's actually with the lab of Dr. Lee. So um, let me just advance a little bit on the conversation so I can show you a little bit of what we are doing. So the objective is to, is to develop um, uh, a NISRU, um, a NISRU test in two facilities. One is going to be in Kennedy Space Center. Uh, I was supposed to be there today about the launch of uh, Artemis was postponed. So the the idea is to, to have the test of this second rover that we are developing in, in, in Mexico in two different facilities with uh, regolith simulants. And this is part of a collaboration of the foreign ministry in, in Mexico and the Korean Space Agency. Uh, so it's going to be uh, a collaboration directly between agencies and uh, a, a series of workshops that we already have in, in Mexico with the Korean Space Agency. But the idea is to uh, test uh, the rover in the facilities of 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 KIST, of, of KIST sorry, in, in Korea. So I'm going to show you just a little bit of how these um, um, lab is is already set up. It's going to be part of an in situ resource utilization utilization program that we have, and we already have signed. And <clears throat> we are going to test uh, various technologies and disciplines uh, like electrochemical engineering, mechanical engineering, thermal control, mechatronics, metrology instrumentation, wireless communication, process protocol. Uh, industrial engineering, of course, um, in order to test these technologies with uh, an, an Airbus uh, technology, which is basically a small reactor for uh, transforming a regolith into oxygen. And um, it's part of our science program. And it's a demonstration project, a ground demonstration project. And in, in the workflow, we, we are going to perform this test in two years. So that's why we uh, start the collaboration uh, with Korea, specifically uh, with Dr. Lee, Lee's, Lee's lab, 
that's me from as part of the Mexican Space Agency and Dr. Um, Ju from uh, the Korea Space Agency. It, it, these are the, the, the kind of meetings that we have uh, with, with the teams, our science teams. And uh, this is the uh, KCT history. They, they, they have a long history in, in industrial engineering and they have a great facility for testing uh, uh, um, <clears throat> technologies on their regolith and simulant uh, um, in, in different characteristics. They have a research and development infrastructure uh, very well established, so everybody can use it around the world. So if someone is developing a technology like this one, it's highly recommend, recommendable. And the building is, is the world's large, largest day TVC facility in, 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 in the world. So that's why we choose it, we choose it instead of the facility that was offered in, in Kennedy Space Center, which was a very small facility. So the, there's a small uh, presentation that they did uh, in order to, um, to show the, the, uh, <clears throat> the vacuum uh, needed in order to uh, test also the, the, the rover and, and, and the joint uh, action with the re reactor. And uh, this is going to be obviously in order to test different technologies for planetary surface and environment simulation. So it's not only for for second lunar mission, it's going to be also for other uh, uh, projects and tests and performances. So uh, I wasn't really prepared, but uh, I thought that uh, it could be interesting to show what Dr. Lee's capabilities lab already have and how we are using them in Mexico because we are already uh, working uh, together. Uh, so if you want, I can answer questions maybe at the end, but uh, I wasn't actually really prepared. Uh, yes, Adrian, uh, thank you very, very much because uh, Dr. Uh, Lee was uh, in the program. He certainly is listed and uh, we'll be, uh, we appreciate your, uh, your help very much. I believe that uh, Bernard is with us now. Where is he? Kim? I don't see him yet. He's not here yet. Okay. We'll, we'll wait a second. You can entertain questions, perhaps. We have him here, I think. <laughs> okay. Well, um, thank you for joining us. Um, Bernard, are you ready to speak? Or um, yeah, yeah I, I'm, um, I'm very pleased to be here. I could uh, get some of the debate, but I was on my travel from the moon, so I could not communicate uh, really uh, with you. I propose that you. You, you wrap up a bit what you were discussing. In the meantime, I could prepare also some, some overall uh, okay, summary of um, the presentation that I made, which uh, in fact uh, is um, combining various aspects linked with uh, training the, the next generation of uh, astronauts uh, from spaceship Earth and uh, to the moon. Uh, I know that we have heard uh, uh, yeah, we have heard uh, some very nice uh, perspective from an um, analog astronaut, uh, from uh, uh, a space architect, uh, from uh, uh, robotic. And so I would like to try to um, uh, build on all this uh, presentation to uh, uh, try to end on a note uh, with a set of actions that we could, uh, um, we could uh, uh, deliver. But uh, so uh, I propose that uh, it would be nice to have um, a short uh, statement from each of the, uh, the speaker, uh, some 30 second uh, statement on uh, how they, they see the next uh, step. And then uh, I would try to make a synthesis of that. Well, I, I think since I let off, I'll uh, make a couple comments. Uh, what I propose is uh, space compacts to basically take the space agenda 2030 and break out uh, specific goals that organizations uh, would commit to. 
So in that way, we operationalize uh, Space Agenda 2030. Uh, and this was done with uh, the energy goal. The UN created a space um, an energy compact. And uh, I uh, worked with ANSOL to prepare an energy compact for energy development in Africa. I believe a similar approach could work for Space Agenda 2030. So that will be a recommendation I'll make to, uh, uh, to Joe and uh, see if we can get that rolling. Mm -hmm. And let's see, we had um, the sequence. I don't have a script per se. Uh, we basically, um, I, I guess we could. Yeah, I, I've seen that you have followed in fact the list as it is uh, listed on the website of the UN which is, uh, okay, uh, I think a, a legit order. Um, I think it, uh, yes, I, I had a slightly different order, uh, starting with um, with uh, current uh, program. But, uh, so I think, but let's uh, still do, um, let's uh, do a summary. And uh, in the meantime, with my, uh, all the- And you, you'll bring your thoughts together. Uh, yeah. Well, let's see. I guess we could have Adriano give a short statement. Recording in progress. Um, yes, I was maybe the, the second or the third one that I, I gave my, uh, my presentation. My presentation was on the 18th, uh, 18th uh, SDG, the, the Civilian Space Development uh, that uh, will sustain all of the other 17 uh, uh, SDGs. This is the, the concept that I presented. Um, I, I found uh, uh, very, very interesting the presentation by made by uh, Pascal Erin Freund, uh, because she presented several, uh, uh, let me say, civil-oriented activities in Earth orbit and on the moon, and that was very interesting. And I would like very much to uh, to have that presentation uh, to publish uh, on our website and and uh, and so on. Um, yes. Oh, okay. However, all of the presentation were interesting. The analog trainings and and uh, uh, and, and what it was presented uh, quite quite. Uh, uh, I think useful in the perspective of uh, civilian space development. Therefore, okay, this is my small resummarization re of of, uh, of today. We don't we hear you, Vidvots. Vidvots, Vidvots is here, and Pascal will speak next. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will just. Okay, so I'm on the show. I'm on the show. And, um, and um, when we are doing the first comment, I think you have two, you have two microphones somewhere. Yeah. Right, it, it, it should be fine. So, what I wanted to say and what I also was. Uh, trying to say in my talk is that um, space exploration is always <clears throat> seen as the very expensive and uh, um, sometimes not so useful uh, part of, uh, of, of, of space and that space applications uh, are the only ones which really, um, how do you say, uh, help the sustainable development goals. And I, I said, uh, I, I think that space exploration plays a very, very important role in, as I said, in international cooperation, um, but also in technology development. And we have seen that in many, many uh, talks and in particular also in the inspiration for the, for the young and also in economic value. There are so many benefits and technologies which we develop for space, which we can use on earth. And that I think we have to promote much more uh, how important space exploration is also for, for, for the benefits uh, of, 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 of uh, society on earth and uh, also helping the sustainable development goals. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Ar <clears throat> Armin. 
Yes, I, I can summarize my talk, or let's say what I have understood of, of this evening. Uh, that that um, yeah, we can we can we can use um, exploration, but also in general space developments uh, to to, and that was let's say probably the focus of of, of my talk to to use all the efforts and and let's say fundings and and resources which has been spent into this uh, division of research to um, yeah, find technologies, identify technologies, methods, and uh, ideas uh, to transform it to humanitarian needs or to sustainable development goals. And that was presented by me by the two projects, the one of the truck in the back uh, for the World Food Program, where we try to um, help them with food delivery, but also this um, agriculture um, project, which we just acquired. Where we use the technologies we developed once for space for uh, directly work on our sustainable development goals. Um, let's say our actual um, hottest challenges, I guess, I, I would assume so. And I can fully underline also that I think that space has a, a lot of potential and that can be transferred by motivating young people and space as no domain than the other, I think, has the challenge to cooperate with other nations because almost no nation is capable of, of um, achieving really big goals alone. So the cooperation aspect, I think, is very highly present and um, also um, executed in space projects. Thank you. Uh, Kiran. Hello, everyone. Um, to summarize my talk today, I expressed uh, my vision of a young lunar explorer. And also I explained how I could uh, bridge from uh, molecular biology with space sciences from nano level of DNA to really at a big, bigger picture of the universe and trying to show, um, also express irrespective of the background of which background you're coming from, if you're a space enthusiast and if you are really intrigued by different of the space fields, you can still connect uh, somewhere down the point and you can always show your interest in space field. It is always open. And this is now we have lots of opportunities where we can really come forward and explore space. And with the Artemis one, uh, really, again, we are going back to the lunar surface. And in future, we are going to have really ample amount of missions. And uh, now we are really, really going back to space. Thank you. Super. Uh, Agatha. Thank you for this uh, very nice discussion uh, altogether. I observed that uh, four presentations out of nine were about education and practical use of space, uh, space technologies, uh, space uh, simulations. So I believe that this is a very good direction to continue in uh, context of sustainability. And especially in this extreme times of crisis uh, you know I'm, I'm from poland so uh, just back on uh, our side there is a war a, a serious war and we always keep it in mind that we need to be prepared to be sustainable to live in our houses with reusing water with reusing uh, all resources and try to to survive and to make this um yeah the, the whole um, life here on the planet um yes available and of course space technologies uh, we all already use satellite internet for example and many many these type of, of uh, goodies that that come from space um but mostly from humans that that create these technologies for space and then they create these technologies uh, for us so please remember humans should be always in the center of space because we are pushing uh, these space technologies forward. Thank you. Roxana, could you summarize? Yeah, well, I'm gonna take the path of education and we were talking about, I was presenting the, my point of view. 
concerning the training of future generation of engineers, explorers, and scientists. And it goes through education to um, the SDA, SDGs um, awareness, uh, sustainable engineering, but also to a sobriety while uh, consuming, while investing energy, budget energy, um, energy budget and water budget. Um, and it goes, we start by, by learning it through analog missions uh, at a small scale and then uh, apply it to a larger scale, to a city, to a country, and then to our whole world. And maybe we will be able to heal it. Thank you. Thank you. Serena? Uh, Ser Serena. Yes, so uh, to summarize my, my talk, I brought, a, a, I hope, a tangible experience and a tangible project uh, made by a young lunar explorer, as I consider myself today in this meeting and in general. So um, yes, I hope that um, through my presentation, but also through the previous ones, uh, what emerged is that uh, we really need to increase the level of scientific investigations that we are doing on Earth uh, for the space field, um, reducing the cost, because this is the key to allow young students, as, as I am, uh, to take part into these research programs. And I, I was really pleased to see uh, all the programs that we have uh, by, the, by the other speakers, by Roxana, by Agatha, in the analog mission. So I really think this is the key to um, inspire and to allow young students to, to have play an active role uh, themselves in, in this path. Dr. Guzman? Dr. Guzman? That too. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm Bernard, I think. The, or, yeah. I really appreciate the opportunity. I, I just want to say that um, um, I, I'm Mexican. I, I don't feel Mexican in space, really. I, I feel like a citizen of the world. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of Dr. Lee because I learned to, to, to create and design satellites in Korea 25 years ago. So it really was the starting place for my career in space. And, and I really appreciate the, 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 the opportunity to speak on, on behalf of space exploration in general. I mean, we are working 27 space agencies on the same goals. I mean, I, I see a lot of, of similar, of, sorry, of familiar faces here. I mean, Armin who's already working on ISIG or Adriano who just recently interviewed one of the Mexican scientists who designed the first uh, uh, lunar mission, or or even uh, I mean people from I, I didn't know before like Agatha, but who, who works with the people from Protec, and I just speak with them yesterday. So every single thing we uh, solve because scientists like to 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 solve things. You know every single thing we solve in order to go into the space is applied to to. A sustainable activity on Earth. I mean, we cannot uh, believe that if if we learn to produce oxygen on the Moon, that's not going to have a benefit on Earth. So, we are explorers. We're a, we're a, a, a civilization of explorers. We have always been, and and this is not going to stop on 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 the atmosphere. So, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak, and 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 hopefully, I can speak. Uh, better of, of Mexico in the future no? we, we are we are we are working hard for it so thank you thank you so no I think we have all of our speakers have spoken and we're I guess we could hear a summary from Bernard <laughs> Bernard, you should unmute. You're muted, Bernard. Okay. I can hear. And action. So, yes, I would like then uh, to, uh, I know many of you, and I had uh, the pleasure to, to work uh, 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 with many of you, collaborate. And I think we need to develop now uh, a joint project where uh, we can uh, uh, push uh, that further. So let's uh, see. How do I... And uh, so this is, uh, can you see that? Yes, this would be 
we to pick space for all researchers, astronauts, explorers, and entrepreneurs. So I think that uh, we have uh, covered a number of topics. I think one I would like uh, still uh, to emphasize again is uh, that uh, there is a lot of work to do on data analysis from previous space missions. And uh, so um, we have to enhance this part of uh, harvesting the science from what has been done. And that's also something that can engage a large part of a uh, you know, brilliant mind from all over the world. Many of the data are available in a uh, in database, uh, uh, astronomical data or planetary data. And so uh, it's very much important also that in the education of everybody, I, I believe also at, at school level and university, everybody would have the chance to play with space data. I believe also that uh, you know we are we have uh, all potential to be uh, a space scientist wherever where we come from, even if we come from the humanities, and uh, I know also from the innovation and artist uh, field, uh, some of those are even better to analyze images than we do in science. So they could already play with space data. Now also uh, we have to find a way to be more inclusive for other people to join the space exploration, utilization, settlement, and a good entry level is uh, to participate to instruments that are uh, being developed or to uh, test some instrument on Earth in order to get uh, some credential to participate to the exploitation of a space instrument. Also, we have heard a very beautiful uh, talk on cooperative robotics uh, from uh, Dr. Armin Vedler. Uh, the state of the art of uh, robotics, which are developed also in service to society, but uh, where the, the space exploration challenge allows us to pull to the extreme and then to get even more benefit for Earth and society. And then uh, uh, for uh, emerging uh, countries, finding a way to uh, participate to space missions that are done uh, by bigger countries, but uh, we have to be more inclusive. And so a number of uh, uh, fora that will allow uh, to really uh, explore uh, space uh, together, also uh, to harvest, uh, for instance, uh, the, uh, the result from Earth observing missions or for the space station in Earth orbit. Now, we, you have heard a number of presentations about analog feed campaign. So we have this program, Your Moon Mars, that now we want to expand to all Earth, Earth, Moon, Mars, and uh, we have developed in various uh, chapters uh, all over the world, some new uh, part, Asia Moon Mars, uh, India Moon Mars, uh, Latin America Moon Mars. And we try to have this model where um, we put in situation in the field uh, to test instruments, but also uh, to um, uh, train uh, astronauts from spaceship Earth. Another aspect which was uh, uh, well addressed uh, by uh, Adriano, for instance, is the fact uh, and also by, uh, um, by uh, Agatha, is the fact that we have also to develop uh, the humanistic aspect of uh, our work and uh, Space Renaissance International uh, as a special mission there. We have uh, also to explore other parts of uh, uh, society uh, uh, benefits, so in particular through cultural, art, and the sociology aspect. And for this, we have some committees uh, like uh, at IF, the Italicus Committee, or we have the Art Chapter of Space Renaissance. And we are now trying to build a, a number of partnerships with uh, other partners, uh, with the IF, with the National Space Society, and so on. So now let's uh, remind what is our, our roadmap. And so we have a roadmap, for instance, for lunar exploration uh, in four phases, uh, where we have done already the orbital fleet, we will do a robotic village, which has started in already 2013. And we will have a human short duration mission with the Artemis program, eventually with other programs like the International Lunar Research Station. And then we are targeting to have a sustainable, permanent presence of humanity together with robots. And we have started that with a fleet of mission. Okay, of course, I'm proud that we launched the first uh, mission of this millennium with ESA, smart one, but 
It was followed uh, by the mission Kaguya, the Chinese Chang'e, the Tian One, which also incorporated a number of international instruments, and um, El Cross that impacted the moon, and El Arbo, which is still in operation now around the moon. A fleet which has changed our view of the moon in terms of science, but in terms of the also resources and defining the next steps. So we have this vision of a sustainable presence on the moon. And uh, this is also embedded in uh, uh, progression where we will continue activities in low Earth orbit. We'll have, uh, now we have two international uh, space stations, uh, in ISS, and we have the Chang'ong, which is also very international. It, it is uh, hosting uh, uh, more than 10 payloads from foreign uh, uh, countries. So we'll continue this. We develop new commercial station. Um, and we are also targeting to have uh, uh, orbital uh, uh, communities, even orbital cities uh, uh, in uh, lower orbit. We'll have activities on the moon surface, uh, also in uh, orbit, the lunar gateway, which is uh, um, uh, not the most effective way to go to the surface of the moon, but which is uh, a way where uh, we can have also an infrastructure in deep space, which could be um, preparing for the the travel to Mars, or also for a mission to deep space like asteroids. Uh, we will go further in exploring Mars, first robotically, uh, with a strong emphasis in searching for life on Mars in the next mission, and also in sample return, which is uh, due by the end of this decade. And then we'll have to see how we uh, prepare humans to Mars, uh, depending on the fact that we find life or not. So there is a but some uh, scientific studies to, to be done before. So the near-term um, program for mission to the moon in Mar and Mars is uh, very uh, full of uh, mission from various countries, even commercial mission in the case of the moon. So the moon is a place where we are going really to um, have uh, many missions, robotic and then humans, and we are going then to settle on the moon. And uh, at some stage, we can develop it at the eight continents of the, of the Earth. Uh, for Mars, uh, there are also a number of missions in the preparation. Uh, their implementation is a bit uh, is quite modified uh, by the current geopolitical uh, conflict situation, particular collaboration with Russia. But um, we hope that uh, eventually uh, we can really use space to uh, make people talk to each other. I mean, we just have a witness the launch of a, of a cosmonaut with two, uh, no, with, of a astronaut, US astronaut together with uh, two uh, cosmonauts. Uh, so there is way still to continue to do peaceful effort together in space. So that's uh, a number of challenges for uh, Moon Village and Mars Village implementation. So this has been addressed, rocketry to get there to learn, robotics, uh, uh, intelligent robotics for operation, communication, uh, survival of, uh, of uh, uh, humans and uh, uh, robots, mobility for both as well, and uh, use of the resources of the moon, of Mars, of asteroid, and the partnership between human and robot. And the new game in town is that uh, we will rely on a lot of additional users compared to, to uh, government. And uh, so we have to unleash this potential of uh, funding of uh, skill of industry, which are from the non-space sector or from the new space. And uh, so uh, uh, Vid Beldad had proposed that we should really start an international lunar decade to unleash this effort, all of us, and uh, then have users that will contribute to settling on the moon. So uh, I want just to remind that you have seen some representative of our your moon mass, Earth moon mass, uh, collaboration. So we have uh, uh, scientists, engineers, data analysts, robotic uh, people, astronauts, uh, space architects. So we have a kind of ecosystem and we want to, to grow this uh, uh, also to, to form, to train young experts, but also to work with more established researchers, industries, and business. So on the topic of data analysis, uh, going back to the data which are available, like from uh, our moon mission or Mars uh, mission and analyzing them with also new techniques like AI, 
uh, with a big data analysis, with a, also virtual representation of uh, those data in order, for instance, to simulate how it will be for a robot or for humans to go on the surface of the moon and Mars. So we have talked about cooperative uh, robotics. So I want you to remind that actually we, we have done this also at the educational level when we built uh, a Google Learner Express landers and we looked at uh, robotic uh, cooperation between small rovers and uh, some of these small rovers, for instance, like uh, you can see the Akuto, the rover are going to make their way to space. So that's a near time uh, space for the investment we have done in the last 10 years. But we have also big, uh, uh, so some small uh, rovers like this one we have uh, tested also as an educational campaign for young researchers to, to see from, from beginning to end how would uh, uh, a campaign would uh, look like. So we deployed some rover, we had a fake uh, uh, landing, and then we look at the sequence of operation. So this is exercise for, for, for training. Let's see. Oh. Okay. This one. Here, I just uh, wanted you, you to witness uh, landing. Okay. And up oh, here, we have landed, we deployed the instrument, and we reverse, you know, functionally the different se sequences. But of course, uh, after you have to do a more sophisticated exercise, and that's what uh, Armin uh, has presented on the behalf of the Robex collaboration, then the new Arches collaboration, which is actually robot for society but uh, where they are tested in extreme environment and where uh, this uh, year in June, uh, okay, uh, we have deployed a set of uh, shoebox uh, uh, instrument with uh, uh, two intelligent rovers and one from ESA, which was teleoperated by an astronaut. And we uh, can show that we can do a number of tasks like uh, uh, science, analyzing sample, even deploying uh, a radio interferometer. So, uh, we have seen that uh, there are places on Earth where that you can analyze to understand better what we could do on the Moon and Mars. Huh? So we we have heard uh, so we have the International Moon Base Alliance uh, with Hank Rogers and from one of the directors, so Tay Sickley, and we have also uh, Jim Caravella, uh, Robert uh, Offord. Uh, but we use also other sites like the Utah Desert, Atacama Desert, Iceland, or Etna for this. So already 12 years ago, uh, we uh, started this Human Mars Speed campaign in Utah for live field research, demo of instrument, also looking at the technology of habitat and the human aspects. So here we, we started using this Mars Desert Research Society uh, base, but now we have at our disposal this uh, base, ICES, which is, uh, can be used by all of you for uh, really doing research, research of the uh, uh, intravehicular activities, but also extravehicular activities in a scene very similar to the moon and Mars. Uh, so now uh, we are also upgrading this uh, with new technologies, new protocols. And uh, we have used, for instance, uh, to do uh, geology research. These are some master students from Amsterdam. Uh, we have done also um, uh, use the facility of the Analog Astronaut Training Center. And so we are now at uh, Your Moon Mars, uh, Poland, um, uh, where we have uh, conducting a number of activities that have been described by Agatha, by Serena and Kiran, with, uh, which uh, have experienced uh, one week uh, in a moon base. And so uh, clearly it's a, a great opportunity also, which we should offer not only to the scientists or uh, young professionals, but also to a large population. If each of us, is really an astronaut from Spaceship Earth. We uh, should use some of this experience also to, to uh, have credibility uh, to become a full-fledged uh, space astronaut. I want also to mention that we are trying to expand this to other places of the, of the world. Like we had a, a campaign that we organized in the Atacama, high altitude uh, glacier near a volcano. And there actually uh, we uh, use uh, this campaign also to do very uh, real uh, earth science. We were monitoring a glacier and how it appears with climate change and the hydrology of this area. And there you have a, a synergy in some of the techniques we use with some of the techniques we try to develop for, for space. 
And we also, we found in this very extreme environment condition which we believe would be very similar to what uh, the early Mars looked like. And we found very special uh, microbes there that were studied by an astrobiologist. So in order to put all this together, we think that it's important to, to have um, a, a kind of a curriculum that could be uh, complementary to what is done in the current university. So one uh, pillar that includes this uh, um, uh, field training, astronaut training, which I think is a great uh, way uh, to develop personally and also as an astronaut. We have also the scientific and technical pillar, which uh, I believe should be taught to everybody from all fields. So the minimum uh, uh, one or one that you need to know about space science, space technology. Um, and uh, we have uh, decided also that it's very important to include the society aspect. Huh? So what are the social uh, needs, uh, human factors, multicultural cooperation, uh, even including art, design, and space. I believe it's also very important that we include there the awareness of the sustainable development goals. Everybody should really use them and see how in their work, uh, even of exploration, they can uh, um, fulfill them and even develop an 18 sustainable development goals expansion into space. We believe also that it's very important to, to train to the management, to the business, uh, to the new ways of attracting uh, partners and sponsors. Uh, so this we train not only the young professionals, but everybody. So to have a lifelong um, popular academy where all these various activities can be, uh, can be uh, trained with modules and everybody could ex expand on that. Actually, we uh, just uh, created now a proposal to the European Commission. It's called Eurospace Hub. And the goal declared is to train space entrepreneurs. But we have realized that in order to train space entrepreneurs, we can also give them some glimpse of training of science, space science and space technology, space humanities, even astronaut training, because then they get even more motivated in uh, uh, creating a business with a the strong background and experience that allows them uh, to convince anybody uh, from Bank of to our bank. So, uh, as a summary, uh, we are still, we are on march, huh, as Mr. Macron would say, we are uh, still uh, in action for a number of activities that uh, have been reported here. We have also a set of um, cultural and artistic and sociology activities that. Uh, we are uh, performing in the frame of uh, various uh, okay, uh, forums, and we have had a, a number of uh, humanists uh, that we are joining some of our uh, activities. And we think that this is something that is very important to develop as some of those can be uh, ambassadors to the society to, of our activities. And uh, let's uh, advertise, for instance, uh, our uh, committee, Itacus on Cultural Tradition of Space that was created in 2007 and uh, that meets twice per year formally, but uh, is also sponsoring a number of activities of uh, cultural production uh, that is our bridging between uh, space and, uh, and uh, uh, humanities. So in short, uh, uh, a new uh, uh, branch of those activities is uh, the fact that uh, we have uh, uh, endorsed a number of goals with the Space Renaissance Congress last year, and we had a number of action plans. I believe that uh, that's something that we would like also to, to share, get uh, people to participate to that. So um, in a sense, that's uh, how I see I would uh, uh, try to work out some way forward. So uh, developing uh, some of these activities of um, um, space data, space instrument, testing in the field, making astronaut uh, uh, training, but uh, in a systematic way, um, also developing an astronautic academy that includes uh, this, um, uh, the scientific, the technology, the humanities, and the business. And also, I believe that uh, now we have also to see how these activities are injected in what uh, the big actors like uh, space agencies, uh, space industries, uh, government and so on, 
we do for exploration. So that's how I would see some action plan for the, the next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernard. Okay. Well, um, I think we're reaching the end of our program. Uh, do we have other folks that want to say some final words? I want to thank you all anyway for uh, your contribution, for the preparation. Uh, also, um, uh, Vid, uh, I want to thank you personally also for having coordinated this uh, quite complex process of organizing a session at the UN. But uh, I think it's uh, quite uh, uh, remarkable. Uh, I would say uh, I'm also very impressed by the, the quality, the diversity, the good gender balance that we have. And so that uh, is a model of what uh, we could uh, propose to the UN. And uh, I think that we have also to work well how we integrate the, the SDG goal into our daily work, uh, even if we are exploring worlds uh, beyond the earth. Thank you. I guess uh, I, I will actually be departing now. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, is there a way we can get a, a family portrait before we leave? Yeah, well, we have a recording of this oh, uh, event. With a, I mean, uh, with a picture of those of you that... Uh, oh, oh that, uh, that, yeah, yeah. We need to create the, um, just a minute, the group view. Yeah, Let me view. get rid of the chat for one. Yeah. And uh, yes, we close have the chat. And now I go to, to the other view uh, gallery. Excellent. And, so uh, this is our gallery. Okay. And we can take a snapshot of that. Yes. And screen. Very good. So and I think, yeah, we have a good uh, uh, world representation. Of course, we have Jim that represents the old Pacific Rim, so that's many countries. Jim Kisafuli. Aloha. <laughs> yes. And it's Aloha. good to see how we expand uh, as well to, to all continents. Antarctica, and then in the future, the moon. Oh, the moon is there, yeah. <laughs> totally, totally loony. Yes, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay, and so I encourage you also to see the other talks from this uh, UN General Assembly uh, special session. A lot, a lot of material. I want also uh, uh, Declan made a great work in coordinating this uh, UJ effort as well. Okay, so picture, yes. Okay. <laughs> Have a great day and see you in a couple of days, uh, Bernard. Yes, uh, we can advertise that uh, VID is also organizing in a few days uh, a special uh, session space for Latvia, but there are many others of interest. Yes, all the best. Have the best. Take care. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for having us. Bye. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank bye. you. Goodbye. Grazie mille. Grazie. <laughs>